Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yankel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm. ShalomHill.org. Did you hear that a new crop is appearing on the prairie? Growing grapes has created an interest among a few individuals who like the challenge of adapting it to our region. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we visit a vineyard to learn about the process and challenges of growing grapes on the prairie. crop has appeared on the prairie, growing grapes, and today I have Florian Letterman with me who's been involved with the process for the last four to five years. Florian, welcome to the show, and tell me, how did you get interested in growing grapes? We got interested actually in, uh, at the University of Morris Horticultural Night. Uh, we sat down in a tent and learned that the uh, university just released four new varieties of grapes that are actually cold hardy. And before that, I always kind of figured grapes were the crop that just kind of came up and, you know, never really bore and died every winter and died back. So that's what spiked our interest. And um, so that very next spring, then, we, we bought five. And they survived and, uh, and did a little more research and decided to go with an acre. And then a year later, another acre. So we ended up with 1,350 vines as a result of that little adventure in Morris. Well, that's interesting. 1,300 vines. How long does it take you to put all those in the ground? We used um, family labor. Yeah. <laughs> so we had, um, it took us, uh, I think probably when we were planting, it took us about three days to put one acre in. That would be for the planting. The posts and the trellis system and everything, that of course took a lot longer than that, but we did that piecemeal. But you got to get the grapes in the ground when they're ready to plant, and so that's that's about what it takes. We dug the holes, but actually with the hard auger system, you know, and then we could go and do it fairly quickly. And the trellis is a very important part of growing grapes. What system did you select, and, and what does it consist of? Most of ours are what's called a VSP, or vertical shoot positioning, which means that the, the grapes that are upright growing grape varieties, which most of ours are, will be uh, caught between wires over a uh, a span of about four feet uh, of uprights. And so we use five wires and kind of straddle the grapes in between those wires and the posts are every 24 feet. So it's a system, uh, one of the many trellis systems out there depending on the varieties that you grow. We have, we're experimenting with a couple other forms also. Try to find out what your variety is like and how your soil is and all that type of thing. So I was always under the understanding that here in west central Minnesota that we really should train the grape to grow horizontal for several feet and then up because of the dieback that we can get uh, from the severe winters. That was true until the cold hardies came out but the cold hardies were developed so that you didn't have to do that and that's what attracted our attention because uh, as you know burying grapes every every fall would be a very large task. And so we, we enjoy the fact that we don't have to do that. There's some things to think about, though, like right where we're standing, actually, in the lowest part of this first vineyard, um, tends to freeze out. And we know that two years ago we had a minus 35 here for three mornings in a row on the level, or up on the, where the cabin is. And it was probably 45 to 50 below here. And so this is the first year, actually, that these have um, survived the winter and, you know, up on the upper levels of the plant. So, 
and they have grapes, but they don't get grapes if they have to come from the ground every year. The grapes always bear on old wood. So if they actually died back, these cool hardy varieties, does the root actually die, or is there going to be some new growth coming from ground level? These particular varieties are tough as nails. I mean, they, they rarely actually totally die. So they'll come up from the root and shoot another you know, number of canes up. It's one of the things about these grapes. They're very hardy and very aggressive growers, especially the, the Frontenac variety, which we grow here. These are all wine-producing grapes. They're not a table grape. We have uh, 14 varieties here, and uh, three varieties are actually a table grape that could be used as a juice grape or a table grape. But most of ours are wine grapes, both the red wine and the white wines. Take me through the process. Uh, what are the things that you need to do to get the grapes up and going? This year we started about the 20th of March, and that's called a winter prune. So all of the wood is taken off down to the, what's called the cordon, or the branches of the trunk, which is at about 40 inches above the ground. So all of that is taken down to that, and some spurs are left, in our case, where the buds are. Um, so that's the winter prune. We spent, uh, we tabulated about 65 hours here of doing that in the two vineyards this year. So all that is taken out of the vineyard and uh, when you can. And the next thing is to wait for bud break, which typically occurs in the middle of May or so, depending on the weather. Last year it occurred a little bit too early and we lost a lot of buds to frost, to the Mother's Day frost last year. Mm -hmm. This year we were lucked out and they, they broke a little later, so that's bud break. Shortly after bud break you get the shoot growth and as soon as it gets to be about oh, eight, ten inches, you start uh, trying to figure out which way they're going to grow and you start doing what's called a a tape and tuck, you can tuck these vines in so they grow between the wires and try to get them to grow upright. They don't all obey those rules. Sometimes they'll grow laterally and then wind will break them off. They're very, very susceptible to wind damage in that early stage, very brittle and soft. That then becomes a lot of walk through the vineyards and it, it gets intensified as you get towards the first of June and middle of June. The next thing would be um, and this is actually a, it's somewhat of a uh, debatable whether we should hedge, which would be taking off the vines that are more mature now, uh, starting to, you know, if they're very vigorous growers, sometimes they'll become like a jungle very quickly. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, the, the variety, the soil type, the weather. This year the weather was very conducive to rapid early growth, you know, the high humidity and the heat. And so others will say that you're just stimulating more growth by doing that. So you try to prune your plant in the spring, which is at the March pruning, so that it's in balance. By balance, you mean you have to balance the number, the right number of buds with the, with the structure of the vine and the structure of the root system. So those three things have to be in balance so that your fruit load is such that you can ripen the grapes and not be too hard on the vine. The vines. If they have too many grapes on them, uh, the next year they, they may have winter injury or actually die down or have a very poor crop the second year. So that's the biggest challenge. Balancing, and I think for all grape growers all over the, all over the world, this is the one technique that you learn uh, the hard way. I mean, you can watch everybody, but until you do it yourself on your vineyard and decide how you're going to prune in what area and what variety, how you're going to do that. And, Okay, well, yeah, let's take a look at uh, the process that you did to get these grapes uh, started this spring. Okay, so in the, in the uh, late winter, early spring, we do what's called a winter prune. So we're, we want to get down to the trunk and the two branches of the vine, which is called a cordon. And off of that cordon, then we want to leave what's called a spur. So we took this particular cane and we cut off everything that was up here and ended up with that short cane which had two buds on it. So here's one bud that actually yielded some leaves, but there's no cluster on it. This one has a little thicker, as you see, it's got two clusters on it. Pretty nice clusters, actually. So that's, that's what you're trying to achieve. So when you're doing the um, winter prune, you want to balance that vine. This is a pretty healthy vine. We probably chose to leave about 50 or 60 buds on this vine. 
Um, obviously, they don't, they don't all, because the one we picked here has only got clusters on one. So if we ended up with uh, two clusters per bud, we could still end up with like 80 clusters, which is a pretty heavy load for a vine like this. Um, so that's when you make decisions then whether or not you should take more buds off, you know, and leave. So that's, that's the system of the winter prune. This winter now, um, we will probably look at this and we'll probably take and prune it off right here. So all this will come out and then the new buds will come off of this node. It's called a node. Mm -hmm. These grapes are approximately a week away from what's called verasion or when they start to turn color. Um, this is a white variety here. So this will turn kind of a, a amber purple. It's the Frontenac Gris grape. Makes a wonderful white wine. So now that I got my basic uh, plant started for the year and now I've got a set of grapes on here, you probably do not come back and prune off additional grapes as the season progresses? No, uh, you might if you feel it's too heavy. We've decided this year that with the weather we had and lots of vigorous growth that we would take a chance that the vine will support this load and that they will ripen. We also had, uh, with the humidity we had this year and heat, we had some black rot, so we have lost some of the berries from a rot condition, which obviously is going to lower the yield, which lowers the amount of stress on the plant. Yeah, our next procedure would have been back in, like in June, we started doing what was the tuck. So these vines like this, if they weren't hanging on to these wires, you can see these wires kind of hidden. If they're not hanging on with their tendrils, we do what's called a uh, tuck and tie uh, with our grapes when they're growing vigorously in the spring. And we use this machine called a taper, which has a little uh, biodegradable tape in it. And if this is the vine and the wire together and you want to get them fixed together, you just stick it in like that, crunch it, it cuts, staples it. And that's a fairly rapid procedure. I got it. Mm -hmm. And you need to have things that work kind of efficiently. The next step we talked about was if you do some hedging, this one right above your head, Larry, that's kind of vulnerable to the wind. If it grows anymore, it's going to be waving out here. Once it gets another foot on there, which could be two, three days of this weather, uh, you probably want to shorten it up. So we'll just do a hedge. Like I say, that is a little bit controversial because now it'll spring new growth out of there. Hopefully it'll start getting cooler and uh, days short enough so that it won't get too aggressive anymore. So that's uh, another process that occurs in July and August coming through, making sure that your alleyways stay fairly wide. And yes, and we're in the later stages of that. Like I say, if the weather uh, turns warm and, and we keep this rain and humidity, we might be fighting it for a while. And then you get this jungle or shading of the plant. The last step that we may do would be what's called leaf pulling. Uh, you go along and just kind of open up the, the vine a little bit so that the sun can get more at the, the grape for the ripening process. The well, that leaf is not needed to produce sugars to finish the yes, grapes? Yes, but it isn't needed as, uh, as much because we've got all these up here. The rule of thumb is about six or seven leaves for every cluster. So if you've got plenty of, cl of, of leaf strength, then you can do that. And that's ideal. You want to be able to have enough. Some of the vines, we wouldn't do any leaf pulling at all. The other thing I noticed is it's very weed free. How do you maintain that so clean? As of late, we're using a machine called a weed badger, which is a cultivator, an in-row cultivator that can go in and out of the row and then alongside the row. We're, our goal is to have about two, two and a half feet of dirt or each vine. So we don't have competition from weeds and it also, I mean, cultivation, we, th we think is better than applying herbicides continuously. We have used herbicides. We still use them occasionally. I mean, there are safe herbicides you can use on, on the grapes and won't affect the crop any. But that is uh, our first choice right now is cultivation. Some downsides to that, um, we had six and a half inches of rain here two weeks ago. Some of our dirt is down there in the, in the valley. If it was all grass, you would avoid that. However, all grass gives competition. The other thing that the dirt does in the spring when the, when the soil is warming up, it warms up much quicker, of course, if the sun can get right at the dirt and there's no leaves. And so we discovered that here by experimentation. We had, we cultivated between two rows and noticed that those grapes were greener, had twice the yield. 
and their roots you know, will go down 15, 17 feet. There's a lot of root system, and that's what you want. You want a good, healthy root that determines the, the health of the vine. This looks like a rather small vine. How, when was this planted? Five years ago. Five years this ago. The fifth, well, four and a half years. This, is, this was uh, in its fifth summer now. Mm -hmm. um, and they vary because of the sand, I think, here. It's, it's a little smaller. If you go to the other side of the vineyard, they're double that size, the, the actual trunk. Sure. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's better because sometimes they get, in the real fertile soil, they get uh, what's called bull canes or um, rapid growth, which is a softer wood, which isn't as winter hardy. And you'll find out then, you know, in the following spring that it was too soft or too fast growing. Something like a water sprout on an apple tree that yeah, very soft and grows straight up yeah. and never produces fruit. And we're still, at this time of the year, we still have what's called suckering where you have uh, the grape is continually wanting to grow, so it'll, it'll bring on, you know, new new um, canes. That's a good thing if you've lost or had winter injury above, or you want to replace a section of a vine, then you'll let one of those suckers grow on up and become a new vine. So you know, it 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 has that ability. Grape is a, it's a, in one, in many ways, it's a very amazing plant, and to survive 35 below and then have you know, 100 degrees in the summer, it. Uh, it's amazing. What kind of problems do we have with either diseases or insects? Here we've been pretty fortunate until this year with the uh, black rot that came in about a month ago. We started to notice one here and there and all of a sudden it was just all over. That is a preventable disease with treatment, uh, but treatment needs of fungicide needs to be started before bloom. And if you're Johnny come lately like I am this year, we pay the price. Um, we didn't have to pay for the fungicide, but right. We uh, ended up, um, we're going to do it next year. But that's what experience tells you. And, you know, and if you can um, guess what the weather's going to be, of course, you're going to apply things a little differently. Some grape growers choose to do it all routinely every year, no matter what, because of the risk. Um, I'm a little more of a risk taker, so, um, you know, that's what you do. But uh, next year, I'm going to do it. And funguses are one of the problems grapes have because of the high humid conditions in Minnesota. It's one of the disadvantages. But one of the pluses is here, um, in our soil here, we, we can grow a fairly vigorous grape, get it up off the ground. As you notice, there isn't anything growing below 40 inches here. And that allows air to move in like today. There's a nice little breeze. Air can keep them dry and they'll be much more healthy. Um, and like our vineyard to the south here is up on, it's about 20 feet higher than this. So a very necessary thing, especially if you've got dense, fertile soil. Well, Florian, I noticed some great grapes here. Can you show us some of the other varieties you're growing? Sure, let's take a look. We have several others right, right nearby. This is an example of a, a grape we're growing called Edelweiss, a uh, much larger grape. It's actually the first grape to actually become uh, ripe in the fall. And so we're looking at about another month. This should be a lot ready, and it's, it's for a very nice, delicate, light white wine. Uh, you pick it at a low sugar content so that it has its best flavor and crispness. Um, it's going to show you an example of a different form of pruning. Instead of doing what's called a spur pruning, uh, we did in, in those other variety, uh, this is called cane pruning. So we let the cane you know, stay on the vine over the winter. So then we get grapes up here. And we, get a, we spread out the, the crop a little bit. Some vines are good at that, others are not. This vine is a little looser, um, looser growing type of grape, so it isn't quite so thick. We have chosen to grow like 14 different varieties just because, well, for this year, number one of our varieties was, was harder on, or had more problems with the uh, black rot. And so it's a good thing we didn't have all of that variety. So um, it makes a difference on the weather and how they respond. I have a question. I'm interested in growing a unique pumpkin or squash in my garden. Can you recommend some interesting varieties? There are a lot of great places now to get um, different unique varieties of squash and pumpkins. Um, one of my favorites is Baker Creek Seed Company. Um, and you can get varieties like this, like an heirloom from Italy. It's Marina. Chiogia, 
Um, it is a sea pumpkin that's grown on the Omafi coast. It's amazing flesh inside, really, really great for eating, and it's also really fun and decorative on the outside. Um, another one is Australian butter. Um, this is the most heavenly um, squash that you'll ever eat. It's like it's like um, pumpkin creme brulee on the inside, really easy to cook, um, creamy and nice. Uh, another great one is a Japanese heirloom, kirimon. Um, it's really, really amazingly interesting. It's, it turns blue and then as it starts to cure, it, it'll actually turn like a nice brown color. Um, the inside is orange and amazing, nice texture, really tasty. Another variety which I haven't gotten the opportunity to try is Greek Sweet Red. Apparently it's got red flesh on the inside. It's supposed to be really, really nice, interesting, different squash variety. I look forward to trying this one. Um, another great thing about squash is that the seeds are highly nutritious. Um, in a variety like Silver Edge has hullless seeds. So they're a lot easy to, easier to chew on. Um, you can cook them, roast them up, um, and they provide a lot of nutrition. Some other varieties are, are purely ornamental, like the Caveman's Club, kind of a new variety for me, kind of a weird dinosaur looking thing. Um, and the Mini Red Turban, kind of looks like a, a mushroom. All these Seeds for these squashes are, are found by just looking up um, heirloom seed or, or rare seed for squash. Good luck uh, choosing your, your different varieties and, and your planting. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. This variety is called St. Pippin. Uh, is uh, very unusual in that it's very delicate vine and you can see right through to the other uh, next row very easily. So the sun um, can penetrate all the way to the back side of the grapevine. This particular vine has a lot of clusters on it. Um, questionable whether or not it has enough leaves to support all this, all this uh, load. And I'm going to guess there's probably close to 20 pounds of grapes on this particular vine. It's also a cane pruned, so you can see the wood from last year here. Uh, so it gives us a, just an opened up type vine. And I'm going to show um, what we use for harvest. First we use people uh, in, this, in our particular vineyard. So we get pickers who are uh, not professionals. Uh, they pick for wine and therefore we have to be careful what kind of tools they use so they don't cut their fingers off. And we use what's called the grape fork. It has a little uh, triangle in there with two little razor blades, but you can't get your finger in there very easily. You know, and so it's a very safe tool for someone who is not used to picking grapes. And the way it's done, you kind of get your cluster in your hand, so they, they seek out the cluster. And just with a very slow movement, they can just pop it off very easy. Like I was telling, this grape Maybe has too many on anyway, right? Uh -huh. So uh, you take the cluster and put it in a basket or some kind of container as you move through your vineyard? Either they'll put the cluster into a, uh, into a tote, a small tote or a bucket, and then in, in the vineyard we'll have big bins that we can dump into and have someone stationed there to watch that no foreign material gets picked, like leaves or ladybugs or that type of thing. And um, you try to keep each variety separate? Is there a concern about that as the, you do the wine process and so forth? Yes. Uh, we sell our, our wine to Carlos Creek Winery. Uh, they need to be identified. They not need to know what variety you're bringing in. You cannot mix them. Uh, if it was for your own wine and you wanted to do a little uh, cuvee, you know, prior to fermentation, you could pick them and mix them. But most people, I think, prefer to pick them as a variety and then blend them later depending on how they ferment and how they taste. Sure. And, and when Carlos Creek is buying this, they're asking for a certain amount of sugar in the grape? We have a contract that we sign which tells what the parameters of the grape need to be in. So as far as the sugar content, the number of, uh, or the pH actually, and then the amount of total acid that's in the grape. And we, we do pre-harvest testing when it gets close to uh, projected harvest time, we'll probably go like every other day and 
we, together we figure out a, a good harvest time based on the weather and you know and what's all happening out in the vineyard um, if we got a big rain coming you know they might choose to take them a little bit before the rain rather than risk losing them does the uh, diseased berries and so forth have a factor in in selling the grapes yes it has to do with the quality so um, we don't deliver you know diseased grapes they would be thrown out before they even get picked or a good picker will notice that and if they don't that's why we have people stationed you know who know what grapes can be taken in sure your fine wines in the world are extremely selected clusters that's how they get the fine wines the, you know the ones that are someone with a trained eye can tell whether or not those clusters are healthy and are going to make a good wine what other varieties do you have we have a couple of table grapes I can show you the, the bluebell Here's an example of the bluebell. The bluebell has a very interesting color, like this, the greenish is almost like a bluish tint to it. Um, in about a week, these will be turning to a dark purple. Uh, and it's called during the Eurasian time, which is the change of color. And this is a table grape. Um, it can be used for juicing or for uh, jams or just eating right off the vine. Last year, we made um, some juice. You crushed it and uh, pressed it and put it in the refrigerator and let it settle down and it was just wonderful grape juice. This is the grape, Larry, that uh, the University of Minnesota's first cold hardy grape, the Frontenac. We have um, 500 of the Frontenac. It's very heavy bearing this year. You can tell by its growth, it's pretty aggressive, a grower. Uh, a little more uh, disease situation. If you look, um, take this cluster right here, you see that the uh, number of shot berries and then also down in this area, some black rot has set in. So that is not a healthy cluster. That one more than likely at picking time would be rejected, uh, as opposed to here. Well, that is a huge cluster. There is, there's a lot of grapes, and some of these will weigh upwards of eight, 10 ounces. And so the Frontenac grape um, makes some great wine. People are figuring how, how to, how to uh, blend it or how to raise it as a varietal vine, wine, and it's um, very cold hardy. Uh, it's, it's probably the number one grape, you know, in this area as far as quantity of grown grapes. Florian, I want to thank you for uh, telling us the story of grapes on the prairie. I might even get excited and grow a few myself. Well, thank you. I'm, we, love, we need more growers. The wineries are looking for more grapes. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yackel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org.